All right, we are recording. So good morning once again, and welcome to our Monday plenary lecture. We're going to be doing this every Monday for the duration of the term. Uh, my name is Professor Marinoff, and I have the duty and also the pleasure of conducting these Monday morning sessions. Uh, as some of you know, we've had to change the arrangements, and I apologize for any inconvenience this may have caused you. Obviously, those of you who are in the room are able to be here Mondays, but you should also know or have been informed that you may watch any of these Monday lectures asynchronously. Uh, I am recording this and all others on Mondays and will upload them to a YouTube channel where they will be available to you for the duration of the term. So I hope to see you all here every Monday, but if for some reason you can't make it on a given Monday, then you can always watch the lecture later that day. I usually have them uploaded by the evening, uh, but you, you can subscribe to the channel and you'll be notified you know, when they're there or just check back and see. Uh, those of you who are in Section M, I'll just uh, put that into the chat room. Uh, section M is my section of this course. That is to say, I meet with you again on Thursdays at, uh, uh, I think it's 11 to 12, 15. So section M is the section that I also take in addition to this plenary, which works across all sections. So I'm sure you understand that arrangement, yes? That those of you who are in section M uh, will meet with me again on the Thursdays at 11 to 12, 15. Yes, you know this, okay. Just, just a reality check, and then uh, um, those of you who are not in oh yes, excuse me, those of you who are not in section M, uh, you have your own section and you have your own instructor. You may have met with that person already uh, last week, if it was a Wednesday or a Thursday or a Friday or a Saturday. Classes began on those days, so you may have had your first class, uh, but subsequently. Um, you'll meet with me on Monday mornings or watch the uh, recording of this plenary, and then you will attend your second lecture of the week as scheduled uh, with your particular instructor. Okay, so I would appreciate if you'd stop chatting, uh, chattering away um, about Discord and other things. Uh, it's very distracting to have people speaking in the classroom when there's a lecture going on, and it's equally distracting to have sidebar conversations in the chat room. Um, so uh, I would ask you to keep that to a minimum and use the chat room to ask questions about what we're doing now. And that way uh, we can stay focused. This is one of the big things that philosophers do is that we focus. Uh, we don't scatter brain ourselves very much and philosophy is going to be useful to you, I hope, no matter what you're studying because it will give you tools to be more critical, more analytical, uh, to broaden your minds, to get you to ask questions, and, uh, and to uh, profit, and not necessarily from getting all the answers you may want, but actually to be uh, more inquiring, specifically about the work you may be doing, in your own major, but also in general in your own lives. Philosophy will enrich your experience, not only of your undergraduate studies, but it will also enrich your overall experience of life if you approach it in a constructive and wholesome way. Okay, so that's just a little bit of an advertisement for philosophy. That's why it's still being taught um, in uh, gen ed courses across the college and the university. Uh, and uh, we're going to be looking at a vast variety of thinkers this term. I trust that your instructors have made the lecture uh, uh, sequence available to you, so you can see each week we t tackle a different philosopher, and uh, there are mainly three sections in the course, so we'll, we'll take it step by step, and uh, probably uh, not everybody will, will enjoy every reading equally, but I am sure that many of you will enjoy many of the readings and that they will provoke you to think in new ways and hopefully in useful ways. So I really uh, hope that you will read ahead. Uh, the more time you spend outside the course, uh, the rule of thumb is for every hour that you're with an instructor, every hour and a quarter, you ought to spend an hour and a quarter outside uh, of that 
uh, just reading and thinking about the material. And the more you put into the course, uh, definitely the more you get out of it. You could just sail through doing the minimum if you wish, but uh, if you put more in, I guarantee you'll get more out. Uh, so just to be absolutely clear to everyone, I'm sure you know this, but let's be uh, sure that you do. Uh, I'm evaluating Section M only, although I am giving the Monday lecture to all of you. My responsibility for grading in this course is uh, restricted to uh, those students who are in my own Section M. Um, okay. And those of you who are in other sections, and there are quite a few other sections, it's a popular course, we run it uh, in multiple sections every term, but those of you who are not in my section M will be evaluated by your own instructors, and they will be giving you uh, the guidelines and the criteria for evaluation, right? My students in M already have my syllabus, and we went over it on Thursday. Okay, is this clear to everyone? Just, just the housekeeping, right? So we know where we are. Uh, your breakout lectures with your own instructors will build on whatever we do Mondays, and uh, you will be evaluated at the end of the day by your own instructor, whoever that may be. Good. I'm getting some yeses. Ashanti, uh, Ramses, uh, Zuleika, pardon me if I mispronounce your names. You will have to correct me as we go along. Jeremy, Jesse, okay. Those yeses indicate that you're all, may, may, for, the, for the most part, you're you're with the program, okay, and you know what's going on. Um, yes, this is going to be recorded onto YouTube, uh, up recorded and uploaded to YouTube every Monday. The recording just has to compile. Uh, you know, we are live, we are recording. Uh, the recording will be saved and uploaded uh, as soon as it becomes available to me uh, after it compiles. So it'll be up every Monday you can expect the recording to appear uh, sometime in the uh, late afternoon or early evening, and it will be there for the duration of the term. In, if you wish to revisit any of the lectures anytime, they'll be there for you. Okay, so that is a little bit of housekeeping, um, and I just wanted everyone to be clear about our agenda. So uh, we're going to, uh, without further ado, launch ourselves uh, into the first reading, uh, which is uh, Descartes' Meditations 1 and 2. I'm going to cover the first meditation with you today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Descartes and what an important uh, philosopher he is. Uh, I'm going to share the screen which uh, has the reading for you, and I've highlighted certain passages in advance. And, of course, the meditations are quite short. There are six of them all together, and they're all in the book. If you want to read them, um, I would I would never stop philosophy students from reading. Um, in my in my section M, we're going to be responsible for the first two meditations, so I'm going to cover his first one with you this morning, uh, and we'll look uh, a little bit more in depth at what he has to say in a moment. Uh, but then uh, on Thursday with my group, we'll do the second meditation. Uh, Descartes provides us with a very good departure point for doing a traditional philosophy course, and I will be illustrating why. Uh, very shortly. Just as a matter of interest, how many of you, or if any of you, have already taken a philosophy course in your own, uh, you know, in your own in your own uh, uh, experience? Have any of you uh, done philosophy before? You could just put yes in the uh, in the chat room if you have. No, never. Okay, never, never. No, no. Okay, that's fine. Uh, there, it, it is not expected. One of you has, Susanna has, okay, most of you, the majority um, have not, and that's a normal thing. Uh, that is to say, uh, normal in the sense that um, there, there is no prerequisite for this course. It's a, it's a gen ed course at a 100 level, and we do not expect, uh, nor do we require that you uh, will have had any philosophy until this morning. If you have, if you've had some experience in discussions and podcasts, and uh, and Deleuze, well, Deleuze went over his own head too. Jesse, you read Deleuze and went over your head. Well, that that was Deleuze's aim to go over everybody's head, including his own. So don't worry about Deleuze, okay? I'm not bashing him. I, I know how to bash people, but uh, I'm just I'm just being humorous with you. Um, I'm I'm no uh, apparently I have a sense of humor, and uh, if some of you are laughing at my jokes already, that's a good sign. I'll probably be able to tell you some philosophy jokes that you won't get yet. 
Um, and if you want to get the jokes, just uh, do more philosophy. You'll eventually get the philosophy jokes, okay? Um, and I'm, I'm glad to see that you, uh, you're you sharing um, a sense of humor this morning. Okay, so without further ado, let's, uh, let's turn to René Descartes. He is often known as the father of modern philosophy, so his, his dates, uh, late uh, 16th century into the uh, mid-17th century, so that's the 1600s when he did his adult work. Uh, he's French originally um, and was very famous in his own time. Uh, he was a mathematician and a logician as well as a philosopher. And if any of you uh, are doing algebra or calculus or physics, uh, you've probably uh, worked and may still be working in a coordinate system that he invented. Does anybody know the name of it? If you're dealing with a two-dimensional space and you have XY coordinates, what do we call those? Anybody want to type the name in of that system? Cartesian plane. Exactly right. Arsh and Eckhart said the same thing, Cartesian coordinates. And those are named after him. They're called Cartesian because he invented them. This is one of his enormous contributions to mathematics. And it turns out, of course, to, to physics too. So prior to Descartes, people were, were using Euclidean geometry, which is very powerful and very ancient. But uh, what Descartes did was he really created what we today call analytical geometry by transposing Euclid from, uh, from you know, the Euclidean plane into the Cartesian plane. Uh, Descartes gave us a much more succinct and powerful way to express certain kinds of functions and to graph them and, and, and so forth. So good that you know this. And that's just one feather in Descartes' cap. Uh, we are today going to look um, at his philosophy and not at his mathematics. Okay, fair enough. So let me uh, share uh, the text with you so we can start to read his meditations. And I will continue to encourage you to ask questions in the chat room uh, or unmute yourselves. I prefer the chat room. It's a lot smoother. Uh, but uh, uh, I also want to say to all of you uh, that uh, in uh, philosophy, we are a, a discipline that asks questions. There are lots of questions that are unanswered. Some may be unanswerable, uh, but basically we are always uh, a questioning discipline. We question everything. And if you want answers, you go across the street and talk to the science people or the engineering people, or you go up to the eighth floor, talk to the mathematics department. They have some answers too, to some kinds of problems. But philosophy, we inherit all the uh, all the sometimes most interesting and unanswerable questions. But that's what we like to do. Okay, uh, Susanna asks, is it Descartes or Descartes? No, there's no accent on the e, Susanna. So it's the former. It's French. And when you see, yeah, Descartes is just spelled, uh, is pronounced, as I've said, with an accent on the first syllable, okay? So your um, generic spelling uh, is, is, is very good. Descartes is exactly how we pronounce him. René is his first name. And uh, typically you would have an accent on both those E's in his first name, so they would be long vowels, René, yeah? But Descartes is pronounced Descartes. Okay. Um, so let's go now to his meditations, and within about uh, 15 minutes, I think you're going to see why we're still reading these meditations after um, all these years. Uh, he, he published them in, uh, first in 1634, I believe. First edition came out in French and English. I read it in the British Library. It's a very beautiful edition, uh, but uh, it's been reprinted you know, hundreds of times since, and uh, it's uh, a long time ago, yeah? 1634 to uh, 2021. It's almost 500 years, but I think you're going to see why. So let me share the screen with you. And again, what I wanted to say was, I uh, interrupted myself, um, there are no such things as foolish questions in philosophy. That's my own philosophy of education. I want to share it with you right from the get-go, that I consider every question to be important. You should never be a chary or a reluctant to ask a question because you think it may be a silly question. There are no silly questions in philosophy. I think every question is important. If you want to ask a question, please put it in the chat room. I will take you seriously. Uh, if you ask enough questions to enough philosophers, you're bound to get some silly answers or foolish answers, I guarantee it. But questions themselves are important. Um, and, and so I encourage you always to be ready to ask. Okay? 
let's now go to Rene Descartes and his first meditation. Just remember how to share the screen. I've already got this thing loaded. I just need to uh, share with you. Just bear with me a moment while I push the buttons. And here he is. Share. Are you able to uh, see the screen? Someone could say yes. I can. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. That's good. Oh uh, yes, professor. Perfect. Okay. I've got the chat room open on the side now as well. So uh, I've just kept the table of contents open because if you're looking for Descartes in your textbook, uh, you will find him here in part three called Knowledge and Reality. So we're dealing with the problem of skepticism mostly, but also with other things about knowledge and what is knowledge and how do we know when we know something and so forth. So here you have Rene Descartes, uh, Meditations on First Philosophy. I will close the table of contents now because you all know how to use that and we'll just look at the meditations. So um, you can read a bit about him here. I will also tell you that if you want to learn more about any of the terminology we're going to introduce and we need to expand our vocabulary to do philosophy, we need to introduce some new terms, at least new to many of you, and that's fine. I want you to learn new words and what they stand for because that's a way of growing your mind also and also sharpening your thinking. Our vocabulary helps us to sharpen our thinking. It's uh, the case that we think as we speak, not the other way around. So the more clearly and, and, and more specifically we can speak, uh, that in turn will help us to think more clearly and specifically as well. And if you have any questions uh, uh, that are deeper than what we're able to cover here, then I would urge you to go to a couple of sources. One would be, I mean, there are millions of sources online, but the Internet, E-N-C-Y-C Encyclopedia, I can't type very well. But I'm trying. Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy is one really good resource. I put that in the chat room. And that will give you some basic information about the philosophers we're covering and also a little bit more detail about some of their guiding ideas. That's a good sort of a general source. And if you want a more sophisticated treatment of anything that we cover here today, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is really good, although it may be a bit advanced in some cases. It's meant often for professors and graduate students, so it's a very, I would say, sophisticated treatment. But by the same token, it's very well written. So if you want to uh, challenge yourselves a bit and get really expert treatments of some of these issues and you don't need to understand all of them uh, you know, in depth. But if you want to get a better handle on some of the terminology that we're using uh, or some of the philosophers whom we study, then either of these sources uh, will be very useful for you, okay? So you can just bear that in mind and make a note um, of those two sources. So Descartes is presenting here a problem of skepticism. Who can say what skepticism means? Does anybody know what it is to be skeptical? What's a synonym for skepticism, anyone? You don't uh, totally believe in something on any uh, thought. Yes, you're, in other words, is, to be skeptical is to, is to doubt. That's good, uh, Ashanti. That's actually a good synonym, doubt. So um, philosophers are very often skeptical, and we often have a phrase called, yes, curious, and asking questions. That's right, Fatima, curious. Uh, and also to, to be... Uh, challenging assertions that are made to us. So in other words, we don't necessarily believe everything we hear, all right? We, we, we want to keep an open mind, but at the same time, we don't want to believe everything everybody tells us. I'm sure you don't go through the day believing everything everybody tells you either. So we would like to talk about something called healthy skepticism in the sense that it's really good for us at times uh, to be able to filter what people tell us through some sort of a mechanism that can test its veracity, test its, its accuracy, its soundness, its truthfulness. We don't want to believe everything we hear. Uh, even small children learn to be skeptical at times. So uh, it's, it's useful. Uh, and at the end of the day, we probably have to believe some things. Uh, very few people, except for some philosophers, can get through the day uh, being skeptical about everything. 
Uh, nonetheless, Descartes' mission is to challenge his knowledge and to ask himself, what does he really have good reason to believe and why? And on the other hand, what does he have good reason to suspect or to disbelieve and why? So this is a very, very important mission that he's on. And he is a bit of a radical, and I don't mean politically now, I mean uh, epistemologically in terms of his philosophy of knowledge. Uh, he is definitely going to push skepticism as far as it goes and not make himself too happy in the process, but he will be able to rescue some important things uh, from this mission. Uh, probably some of you still uh, have heard in circulation the phrase, I think, therefore I am. Is this still known to any of you? Have any of you ever heard somebody say that? I think, therefore I am. Yeah, amazingly enough, um, a lot of you are saying yes. This always uh, impresses me, makes me happy, because it's one of the sayings that's uh, most important from Descartes, and now you know that it's 500 years old, more or less, uh, and uh, you, you also know, or should I say 400, I think my math is not very good this morning, it's too early, so if he wrote this in you know, the 1630s, it's almost 400 years, um, but basically this is in circulation, and you don't uh, need to know much about philosophy to have heard this in the air, but we're going to look at it in this reading and see how he comes there. All right, so let's begin. Uh, and he's asking in the first place, uh, what can be called into doubt? Yeah, what can be called into doubt? Well, for several years now, Descartes says, I've been aware that I accepted many falsehoods as true in my youth, uh, as we all do, uh, and that what I built on the foundation of those falsehoods was dubious. Dubious means doubtful, right? Same root. To be, you know, something is dubious, it means it's doubtful. And therefore that, once in my life, I would need to tear down everything and begin anew from the foundations if I wanted to establish any firm and lasting knowledge. So that's what makes him a radical skeptic, because he's going to say, well, if I accepted some things in my youth that were false, which I actually believe to be true, I have to conduct a closer examination of all my beliefs because maybe I accepted even more things as false than I realized. Could someone give, can any of you think of examples in your own case where when, when you were young you accepted something as true, which later you realized was not true? Anybody think about, there are a couple of obvious examples. Uh, tooth fairy, those are the ones that most, call, yes, Santa Claus, and the, and the tooth fairy, exactly. So when we're children, uh, we, we tend to accept those things, right? People, you know, young children, small children may very devoutly believe that if they put a tooth under their pillow, then uh, wake up in the morning and find money there. The tooth fairy <laughs> did this. But at a certain point in life, presumably, you start doubting that, right? You start saying, well, wait a second. Probably my, one of my parents did it, you know? And the same with Santa Claus. Isn't it the case that we can control children? To a certain point with the story of Santa Claus, like if you're good, Santa will bring you something, and if you're bad, Santa won't. Isn't that really how Santa is presented to you as someone who will give you gifts, provided what? Provided you do what your parents want at the end of the day. So in other words, you're bribing. You know, we're using Santa as a way of controlling behavior of children, which is hard enough anyway, even with Santa in the mix. But it's also a form of, um, of bribery. It's what we call the carrot. Yeah, we give you give you offer a reward to someone. It's behavioral conditioning, in other words. Do what I want you to do, I'll give you a reward. And don't do what I want you to do, and you won't get a punishment, but you your punishment will be that you don't get a reward. Correct? So we call this in psychology, this is behavioral conditioning. Um, but uh, uh, Santa is not the only thing. I mean, Santa and the Tooth Fairy are, are, very, are very common examples of exactly this. But Descartes goes beyond this. Because it may also be the case that you've been told, and I don't mean with malice aforethought, people spread um, inadvertently perhaps all kinds of untruths. There are lots of beliefs which are untrue that sort of circulate widely. People used to believe the earth was flat, right? Uh, maybe some people still do. I think there's a flat earth society in the States. You could join it. Um, but uh, people believe all kinds of things uh, when they don't uh, exercise critical thinking. And this is what Descartes wants to do. So he wants to be very critical of all his beliefs. So at the end of the day, his, his mission is really to end up having only true beliefs. And in order to accomplish that, he says, I ought to withhold, I'm referring to the second highlight down there, 
I ought to withhold my assent, just as carefully from what is not obviously certain and indubitable as from what is obviously false. So indubitable means cannot be doubted, right? So he wants to withhold his assent just as carefully from what is not obviously certain and indubitable as from what is obviously false. In other words, if something is obviously false, he, he's not going to believe it. But if something is not obviously certain, he's not going to believe it either. That's what makes him a radical skeptic. So he's going to want to believe what's true or what he can convince himself of as true. He wants to disbelieve, obviously, what is false. But there's a lot of things in the middle. If you think about it, and I hope you are, uh, you realize that not all of our knowledge falls into one of two categories. The things that we believe are not all either true or false. There are a bunch of things that are uncertain, and maybe we could never know. So Descartes is saying, to be on the safe side, I'm going to reject what is doubtful. Even if I don't know that it's false, I'm still not going to take a chance. Can any of you think of any proposition or any belief of whose truth or falsehood we are unsure? In other words, can you think of some statement or some proposition that that might be true or might be false? Any ideas? This is about the world now, right? God is real. Well, that's a pretty good one. All of you are jumping on this very quickly, and I think that in a philosophy class, that's exactly right. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's for a philosopher like myself and for most of my colleagues, uh, the big question about God is not answerable by us. Either God exists and God is so powerful that we as humans are not able with our minds to really understand God, so we believe in God, right? Or we don't. Um, but uh, Descartes does believe in God at the end of the day, but even he says, well, I don't really know, uh, you know, that, that God really exists until he proves it to himself in Meditation 3. If you want that, you can read ahead. But in general, we would say that religion, a philosopher uh, would generally say that religion is a matter of faith. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be fair? Um, we'll get to space and time in a moment, Ramses. That's another important, definitely important category of beliefs. Um, but uh, I'm just saying to you that if you um, are religious uh, in any, you know, if you're a, 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 an adherence to any religion, we, we have a synonym in English. We call religions faiths, right? We say, you know, I, I have a faith, uh, meaning I have a specific kind of religion. Surely you, you know that kind of usage of the word faith. And generally speaking, if you are religious, it probably means you have faith, um, if you want to think about it in that way. Uh, because when people lose their faith, if people lose their faith for any reason, that means they've probably lost their religious belief. Fair to say? Is it fair to say? So if that's the case, then religion uh, is faith-based. I think it's very clear-cut. Um, people who believe in God or believe in gods or believe in whatever scripture they believe in have faith in its truth. Uh, but uh, Descartes uh, wants to doubt things, okay? So if nothing is provable to him, uh, it may be true and it may be false, he's going to withhold his assent. He's going to treat it as false just to be on the safe side. Uh, so he didn't believe in any certainty or, Sudener, you're saying he didn't believe in any uncertainty. Yes, I think what you mean is that if something is uncertain, he's going to reject it also. I think that's what you're saying, correct? So if something is false, he will reject it. And if something is uncertain, he will also write. So he, if something's uncertain, he will also reject it. Just in case it turns out to be false, he doesn't want to take the chance. That, that's what makes him a radical skeptic. All right, very well. Uh, and science is like this also. There are many theories out there. We know that science is self-correcting on a good day uh, when it's not politically interfered with. Scientists are self-correcting. In other words, they will discover the, the extent of the applicability of a certain theory or where they will find a new experiment that shows that the theory is false or, or some way flawed and needs to be modified or improved. And the history of science is this history of self-correction and this history of expanding our knowledge into new areas. That's exactly right. But there are many, many things in science which are uncertain at this point. 
And it doesn't matter how much certainty we have. Science is a subject, any science, whether it's physical or, or you know, natural science, social science. Science is, is, is an interesting, very interesting topic for philosophers because in any science, you're going to have a certain core set of uh, beliefs or theories which, which apparently are true and which get modified internally over time to get slightly better formulated. But you're always reaching out to the unknown and trying to capture new things and as our instrumentation gets better uh, out there, if we're doing cosmology, we discover new things going on in the universe, and we don't have explanations for them necessarily. So we have to push our theories ever further in order to explain or account for new data that are being discovered, new phenomena that uh, of whose existence we were formerly unaware. So yeah, science provides a very rich and very fertile field for exactly this kind of inquiry and scientists have to be skeptics too that that's how we make progress and not so much always by discovering what's true but by rejecting what's false so descartes is uh, the f father of modern philosophy and also in that sense the father of modern science because of his method okay he's not doing a particular science but he's really giving us a way of trying to get closer to the truth about things. All right. Now, here comes a big philosophical point in that third highlight. And I'll read it, and then I'm going to introduce a couple of new words to you in the chat room. Descartes says, of course, whatever I have so far accepted as supremely true, I have learned either from the senses or through the senses. The senses being... Normally, in the West, we recognize five senses, yes? Sight, hearing, t taste, touch, smell. Now, those are generally what we speak of as the five senses. And Descartes is saying that most of the knowledge that he's acquired in his life to this point has come from the senses or through the senses. In other words, you're you're attending this class and you're using what? You're using your sense of sight and your sense of hearing, right? In order to to take in uh, the the information. Uh, so you're learning through your senses right now. When we read a book, we're we're using our sense of sight. If we listen to a podcast or a, an audio book or whatever, we're using our sense of hearing. Uh, when we interact with the world, we're using all our senses, but we're learning about whether food tastes good or not because we taste it all right so a lot of what we discover about the world inevitably is being interfaced by our senses and the problem with that says descartes and is as follows buddy he goes on i have occasionally caught the senses deceiving me and it would be prudent for me never completely to trust those who have cheated me even once prudent means um you know, prudent means uh, uh, good for myself, uh, self-preservative in a certain way. Okay, wise, if you want another synonym. Right? Um, so can you think of cases, again, I'm turning it over to you. Um, well, there you go, Arsh, you, you're already on the next page. I like the question, how do we know senses are providing us a sense of reality? We don't. And uh, this is a very interesting question that you've raised. Uh, and this is the this is the question that Descartes is tackling right now, as you can see. We'll get on to his his response to his own question in, in a moment, and it's going to resemble yours, Arsh. Yeah, Ramsey says hallucinations. Sure. Well, I'm I'm hoping you're not hallucinating on a daily basis out there, okay? Um, you know, I mean, if you're hallucinating on a daily basis, you may have another issue. But but basically, that would be one example. Um, your subconscious could be telling you something it already knows. Uh, well, how would it already know something, Orsh? Uh, you know, if you're dreaming, um, that's usually based on an experience that you've already had, which is being reinterpreted somewhere and then reprojected during your sleep, right? It's an internal sense, but it also comes from the external. Uh, basically, dreams are based normally on some experience that we've had. Well, there you go. Now, you guys are already ahead of this reading by asking whether, um, whether life itself uh, let me back up, all right? You're, you're asking some terrific questions. I just need to...
back up a little bit. I'm really glad Descartes is making you think this way. Bias. Yes, Jesse, we all um, have confirmation bias, and that's because it's instilled already by something we've accepted as true, which may not be true. Yeah, that's the problem with bias, that we already are filtering. Everything we even perceive on a daily basis is already being filtered through that things we already believe to be the case, whether we believe correctly or incorrectly. So bias is extremely hard to avoid, except as Descartes will discover, in subjects like logic and mathematics, we can be pretty sure that our theorems are really true. Uh, but when it comes to doing other sciences, which depend on perception, and when it comes to doing arts uh, and humanities, which also depend on perception, uh, then our knowledge is going to be much more subject to variability and, and, to, and to dispute or to disagreement and so forth. So this is a big concern for him because he really wants to know what's true. Uh, so let me just continue through the chat room a little bit uh, and, and, and check out these messages uh, because you're saying, um, how do we know we could be dreaming? That's right, Arsh. We could all be right now in some, in some dream that someone else is having and we don't really know. Uh, Bertrand Russell, a very important philosopher in the 20th century, uh, once proposed that if the universe and everything in it, including ourselves, had been created five minutes ago, including all the memories we have, right, of our previous years in our lives, including all the fossils, you know, of dinosaurs. Include so imagine that everything in the universe were actually created by some very powerful God, you know, like five minutes ago, everything suddenly came into existence as it is. How would we know the difference? And Russell's answer is, <clears throat> we wouldn't. We wouldn't have any way, objectively, of knowing the difference. Okay, so it's a bias as a, as a blessing and a curse. Yes, uh, sometimes white noise. Yes, we, we hear things all the time. Um, and uh, you realize, uh, some of you, that uh, it's not just about bias. Uh, how many of you have, um, let's say, I've been driving down a road in the summertime and you'll look down on the highway and see, yeah, optical illusions. Exactly, Zuleika. And, and, and psychology textbooks are full, full of optical illusions. And we even know what we're seeing may not be actually real. It may be illusory in some way, but our, even our rational minds can very easily be defeated by what we may later discover to be an illusion, whether it's optical or from another sense. How many of you seen puddles of water on the highway? If you're on a very hot day and you're driving down the road and you look ahead, you may see puddles of water, right? But when you get there, it's just pavement. It may be a dip in the road that's reflecting uh, the light and retaining the heat in such a way that it appears from a very sharp angle far away to look like water, but we know it's an illusion. Uh, people see mirages in the desert too, especially if they're thirsty, they may see water. And when they get to the mirage, you know, when they get to what they think is an oasis, it's just more sand. So that kind of thing happens. But if it happens with our sense of sight, think about it, our sense of sight is our primary sense, but actually it happens with hearing too. Uh, we, we, we can very easily hear things that are not really there. Uh, we can, we can, uh, it's happened to me lots of times. If you're expecting an important phone call, uh, you may think your phone is ringing when it isn't. You may hear some other phone ringing um, and so forth. Uh, when it's really uh, not your phone, you may, you may hear things that, that are interpreted as other than they really are in terms of the source. Well, how do we know that our past is an illusion? Well, Arsh, that's right, because memories are also a big problem. And memories are only memories of things that we have previously sensed, yes? So if you're, you're going now in a very good direction down Descartes' road, because if you remember what you had for breakfast yesterday, then it, that memory presumably depends on what you really had for breakfast yesterday. So it's, again, the world of senses, what the food that you saw, the tasted, you know, touched, maybe felt, and, and so forth. But what about false memory? It's very easy for memories to be stored imperfectly. It's easy for experiences to be misremembered. Uh, the famous uh, uh, illustration of this would be eyewitness accounts. How is it that 12 eyewitnesses can all give a different account of what they saw? Isn't that astounding? You have 12 people who witnessed something, and when you separate them and ask them what they, what they witnessed, you'll get very often completely different accounts of what happened, right? 
And they all saw the same thing. I mean, our, our logical minds tell us that things didn't happen in 12 different ways. You know, some event happened one way, uh, but everybody may have seen it from a different perspective and filtered it differently, remembered it differently. So this is all going back to Descartes saying, well, our senses are deceiving us, right? I mean, our, at times. The problem is we don't really know when our senses are deceiving us and when they aren't. So that, that just drives home his point, that if our senses sometimes deceive us, says Descartes, then I should reject what they're saying. I should not believe them. Remember, this is his radical skepticism, because if our senses are sometimes deceiving us and sometimes not deceiving us, and we can't really reliably tell the difference, then we're going to be safer, says Descartes, if we reject all the evidence of the senses. We simply don't believe anything that we sense, and therefore uh, we're, not going to disp we're not going to have any false beliefs from the senses. Okay, that, that, That's his radical mission. And somebody earlier in the chat room ha had made a point about being a brain in a vat, and I mean that's exactly right. And this is this is of course what Descartes is anticipating, because if we were imagine, and we're almost there, not quite, but technologically, if you can imagine a brain a brain in a vat, here it is. This was Habiba. How do you know you are not just a brain in a lab being fed stimuli? Exactly right, Habiba. We don't know this. Uh, because if you did hook up a brain in a vat to the appropriate wiring, you could you could stimulate, if we knew how, we're getting there, right? With computer simulation, we could feed digital images into that brain and make that brain hallucinate that it's hearing sounds when nothing is being played. It could make that brain hallucinate that it's seeing things when it doesn't even have eyes. If we stimulate the visual cortex in the right way or learn to, we could indeed simulate uh, a brain having real experiences of the senses, even though the brain is hooked up to a simulation of the senses and not to real bodily senses. But this is exactly Descartes' point. How do we know we're not brains and bats? And that's why he anticipates what famous movie? What are we talking about? If we're, if we're talking about the world not being real and we're just being, you know, we're being, we're some programs being run in our brains to make us think that reality is real? What movie's that? Anybody? The Matrix. Yeah, exactly. Good for you. So you see, and The Matrix, I don't know if the directors uh, had read, and Inception also, that's a newer one, but the, the classic one is now going back quite a few years, but The Matrix is exactly the movie that's being made of this meditation. Whether the, the writer and the director had read Descartes, I don't know, but they obviously captured that main point that it's very difficult for us to know what's real and what isn't. Now, I don't expect you to lay awake at night worrying about this because you all have some real life or think you do, but philosophers like to worry about these things, okay? And sometimes it's well worth contemplating. All right, I'm not asking you to be as radical as Descartes, but I see that I don't need to encourage you very much to go down the road with him and see where it leads. So that's very good. I, I like your spirit, okay? This is very good that you're willing to go along with him for the sake of argument. And let's see where it gets him. Okay, so good for you. Let's continue now uh, with the uh, with the with the uh, reading. If I can find the button, I've got to shift these uh, windows around. Uh, are you still seeing the Are you seeing the next page now? Everybody seeing it? Yes. Good. Okay. So so here's the question. You guys have already anticipated this. Uh, how often a dream has convinced me that. Uh, I was here, sitting before the fire, wearing my dressing gown, when in fact I was undressed in between the covers. Let me ask it back to you, um, especially with nightmares. How many of you have ever awakened, if you're having a nightmare, sometimes you wake up, right? If it's a really bad dream, it sometimes makes you wake up. And have you yeah. ever um, have you ever had the experience of where you're having a really scary dream and you wake up and you're still scared? Have you ever had that? I'm not asking you to now tell me all about it, but yes. all, we've all had this. This is part of our uh, common, our shared experience that sometimes a dream can be so scary that we will, I hope not all the time, but, <laughs> but if you wake up and you're still scared, it means that the fear is real, even though what was causing the fear is not. Are you with me? The dream is not real in a substantial sense, but it could really make you feel real emotions. Yes? So there we have a perfect case you know, where a dream is actually making us think it's real and scaring us. And, and we even wake up scared and we have to kind of regain our consciousness and realize it was just a bad dream. 
So there you go. And then he's asking the question you've already asked. How do we know we're not dreaming right now? How do we know we're not all uh, brains and vats at this moment being stimulated by some very sophisticated uh, computer uh, system that's, you know, giving us the experience of being in a Zoom lecture, uh, whereas, in, whereas in fact, it's not real at all. We don't know for a fact that, that that's not the case. Okay. So, um, all right. So when Descartes uh, conclude what, what Descartes concludes from this is, uh, when I think very carefully, he says, I see plainly that there are no reliable signs by which I can distinguish sleeping from waking. I mean, if he really thinks about it objectively, he, he, he realizes that, that it's really, uh, really impossible fully to distinguish between what is real and what is not. I mean, you can pinch yourself and see if it hurts, but then that's just another experience of your senses, right? And you know that people who unfortunately lose limbs, um, if a limb is amputated, you know that medically you can read all the case literature, people still feel phantom pain. Do you know about this? Uh, people say, I have a pain in my arm, even though the arm may not be there, or I have a pain in my leg, even though the leg may not be there. It's called phantom pain. So the pain is real to them, but where the pain is located is no longer existing. It's in a limb that is absent. And they'll still say, I have a pain in my leg, even though they have no leg. So once again, this would illustrate Descartes' point that, 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 that it's very difficult to draw a bright line in the sand and say, okay, this side of the line is real, and that side of the line is imaginary. So reality is a much stranger place, a much slipperier, a much more slippery place than, than we, we you know, generally assume in our day-to-day -day lives. And of course, you have to assume certain things to get through the day. But if you have the leisure uh, to be philosophical at times, then it is certainly not difficult to go down this road with Descartes and really start thinking more carefully about what can be doubted. Okay, And so he comes to one important conclusion here, which uh, I need to scroll down to, to, to get to. So he's talking now in this paragraph at the bottom of the column and up to the next column. He is able to discover something which is helpful for his program. He says, perhaps, perhaps, again, not for sure, but perhaps we can correctly infer that. While physics, astronomy, medicine, and other disciplines requiring the study of composites are dubious, disciplines like arithmetic and geometry which deal only with completely simple and universal things without regard to whether they exist in the world are somehow certain and indubitable. This is very important. I will go over this in a moment with you. Whether we are awake or asleep, 2 plus 3 is always 5, and the square never has more than four sides. It seems impossible even to suspect such obvious truths of falsity. So he's drawing a line between what we today would call empirical sciences and on the other side of the line logic and math okay so a line between i'll type that in um, i want to uh introduce this word empirical does anybody know the term i'm typing it in now not imperial empiricism is not imperialism this is not political empirical sciences empirical means through the, via the senses what is empirical uh, knowledge is knowledge that comes to us through the senses. Between empirical sciences and logic and math, which are not empirical because you don't need any of your five senses to do logic or math, you can do that in your mind alone or in your brain alone if you prefer. Right? You can think about mathematics when you are solving a question um, like 1 plus 1, you don't need to see, hear, taste, touch, or smell uh, the equation. You can do it in your mind, yeah? And uh, by contrast, when you're doing physics, I mean, theoretical physics is in your mind, but if you're doing any kind of experimental science, experimental physics, astronomy, you're looking at planets, stars, galaxies, that's empirical. Medicine is empirical. You're trying to find... Uh, the causes of diseases and cure them. That's empirical. Um, most sciences are uh, either empirical or have empirical uh, dimensions to them. Chemistry, empirical. Biology, empirical. Uh, social sciences, psychology, sociology, economics, uh, all empirical, 
right? They're all empirical, yeah? Do you need senses like, uh, a question from Ramsey, is you need senses like sight to comprehend objects? Like, Well, I would say, and Descartes would probably say you don't, Ramsey's, because if you close your eyes, you could very easily picture a square or a circle. And in theory, and in practice, someone, in fact, who's born without vision, let's say someone who is, who is, who is blind, right? Uh, well, you say because we've seen them before, Kendrick, but I'm saying something different, and Descartes is saying something different. Um, imagine someone who has no uh, sense of vision. There are lots of people who, who are blind, right? And they use various ways to get around, be it a cane or a, a, a you know a dog, service dog, a seeing eye dog, and so forth. But nonetheless, people can can imagine. That's right, Sidney. You, know, you can if someone says to you, imagine a four sided figure. You know, with right angle at each at each corner at each uh, you know at each corner, that's a square, a four sided figure with sides of equal length and right angles in the interior square. Anybody can imagine that if it's described to them in a language they speak, and they don't have to see it. Similarly, anybody could imagine. You could ask children or ask adults who are blind and deaf, who went to school and who learned math. They didn't need to see or hear. Uh, the teacher, they didn't need to read the textbook in order to be able to use the power of their minds to do mathematics. And so this is very important. If you think about it, I'm sure you, you'll see Descartes' point that when we're studying things in the world, obviously we need to interact with them in some way. And so we need our senses. And if you think about it also, you realize that what science does very powerfully is that it gives us instruments which expand the range of our senses. So a telescope allows us to see much further and more clearly than our naked eye does, right? A microscope allows us to see much smaller things at higher degrees of magnification than our naked eye does. A parabolic receiver allows us to hear sounds which our own ears might not pick up unaided, and so forth. So you can think about how all this tremendous instrumentation that science devises is really doing what? It's expanding our senses so we can take in more data. So all of these empirical sciences are really still sense-based, and instrumentation just does a, a better job of our own natural biological senses at gathering data. But explaining the data is something that our minds are doing, Descartes would say. This is not what our, you know, our eyes are not telling us what we see. Our minds are interpreting that image in some way. So Descartes says that composite things, composite meaning made up of a lot of stuff, uh, you know, planets are made of a lot of things. Uh, galaxies made of more things. Uh, if you look at a cell, it has lots of component parts, right? As we study the phenomena of nature, on whatever scale we study them, we see that phenomena are composites. Even the periodic table, each thing we consider an element, is still composite, right? It consists of what? It consists of subatomic particles, yes? Electrons, protons, neutrons, and those things are composites too. Apparently, they're made of quarks, or, you know, they're made of other things. They're, and the quarks are made of strings, and the strings are made of superstrings. So everything is made up of stuff, and, and, and these are all composites. And because we are studying composites of necessity with empirical help, because they are in some kind of extra mental reality, a, a world outside of our minds, we need our senses or instruments that expand our senses in order to study these composites, whatever the field is, whether you're studying, you know, a galaxy or a society, you're studying composites. And he says, for this reason alone, composites are going to be dubious. In other words, what we learn from studying composite things are going to uh, be dubious. We're going to have all kinds of information, but we're not really going to be sure what to believe or not at times. Whereas disciplines like arithmetic and geometry and also logic um, are going to deal with simple, abstracts, universal things without regard, in fact, to whether they exist in the world. And yet they're certain and indubitable. If you think about it, isn't it so that, for example, if 1 plus 1 equals 2, which I, I think is pretty much indubitable, uh, because if 1 plus 1 did not equal 2, then none of our computers would work. We wouldn't be able to ha be meeting here today. 
because everything that we're using is a binary, you know, we're using digital devices, they're binary devices, and they depend on the fact that 1 plus 1 is 2, or in binary arithmetic, 1 plus 1 is 10. So don't worry about that, but it's, it's, it's pretty much consistent worldwide. How about if you went to the moon? Would 1 plus 1 still be 2 on the moon? What do you think? Yes, of course. And in fact, Ramses, we know that it is because we sent astronauts there and they came back. If we sent them to the moon and one plus one were three on the moon, then all the equipment wouldn't work and they'd be stranded. So, you know, th this is, well, the nature of the universe, maybe. But it's certainly the case, as Descartes says, that these abstract truths, right, these abstract truths seem to be true everywhere and forever. One plus one was two, probably even before people proved it. You know, one plus one was two during the time of the dinosaurs, although there was nobody around to say it. But it must have been the case, and it'll probably be the case, we, we think, you know, in the future. Um, so that is because we're dealing with abstract ideas and not composite things. And so we can have a better knowledge, says Descartes, of the abstract things that our minds can come up with. And that means that reliable knowledge comes from the mind and not from the senses. That is the takeaway. So now I'm going to introduce... Uh, something called uh, rationalism to you, and we're gonna we're gonna stop this share for a moment. So uh, uh, the point that Descartes is making, and I'll put it in the chat room, is that we have really um, the statement from Descartes indirectly here of what we call rationalism. Descartes is a rationalist, and to be a rationalist, okay, rationalism. I'm typing it in. Uh, rationalism asserts that reliable knowledge of any if we happen to have reliable knowledge uh, in the way that Descartes wants us to have it rationalism asserts that reliable knowledge comes from the mind not the senses okay that's the main point that if uh, it comes from the mind not the senses okay not T mind but the mind all right my typo there whereas um, empiricism and the contrasting philosophy and we're going to meet an empiricist next week because for every philosopher there's a counter position that we can take uh, every philosopher who argues for anything can always uh, will always encounter some other philosopher who will come up with the opposite point of view or a different point of view empiricism asserts in fact that knowledge that all knowledge, not reliable or not, that all knowledge comes from the senses. That we wouldn't know anything if we didn't have any senses. So those are two very different perspectives, and I'm not giving you uh, uh, robust dictionary definitions. You can look up these terms. I'm just introducing them as some very important piece of vocabulary uh, Descartes is a rationalist, so is Plato. Descartes, in fact, got a lot of his rationalism from Plato. We'll see Plato later in this course. Empiricism is a really opposed in a certain fundamental way. It's saying, no, 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 if you know anything, you must have learned it from your senses. Descartes is saying, the only reliable knowledge I have is not from my senses. Whatever I got from my senses may be either false or uncertain, and I, and I have to reject it because uh, I can't believe it all. Um, and so I'm not going to believe much, but what I seem to know best is mathematics and logic, and those things don't come from my senses, they come from my rational mind, as they do from yours. So those are two different uh, points of view, and the philosophy that we're discussing here, if you want to know what umbrella is this, it's uh, really uh, the debate between, for example, rationalists and empiricists, is unfolding in the domain of epistemology, just so you'll have the term, epistemology, which is, as you may already have suspected, philosophy of knowledge. Okay? So if we're having any kind of a debate about what is knowledge, where does it come from, how do we know what's true and what's false, then we are doing epistemology. Okay, That's the, uh, the vocabulary that you need um, to be able to get a handle on this part of the course. Philosophy of knowledge is epistemology. Okay? And one of the main schools is the rationalist school. Another of the main schools is the empiricist school. And obviously, rationalists and empiricists don't believe the same things about knowledge. Okay, is that fair enough?
Are we clear about that distinction? Yes, Professor. All right. Well, that's fine. So this is really uh, this is really fundamental. Uh, I will tell you something interesting, though, um, since since you're you're following this well and you're you're obviously engaged. I mean, Descartes' distrust of the senses uh, may seem the first time you encounter it as like unnecessarily radical. But let me ask you now if you take that perspective in the area of, let's say, interpersonal relations. Let's say that you have a friend who uh, suddenly you thought was a very good friend and suddenly you discover that person deceived you. Okay, it happens, right? We get deceived by people from time to time. I hope not every day. But you may be deceived by someone whom you once trusted. Does that happen? Does that happen to you? Is that something that, you know, happens actually quite often? that we, we can be deceived by somebody, right? Okay, so then the question is, sadly, yeah, Kendrick, it is sad, but I mean, if you want to now be philosophical about it and go even further, and I'm not trying to go there today, but, uh, well, it's not just politics. It could be in a relationship. You know, someone could be, you know, seeing other people in and in saying they're faithful to you, right? And maybe they're having, you know, a relationship on the side. Well, that's a deception, right? And Descartes' point is that if somebody ever deceived you, I mean, I agree, politics is, is just completely deception, and it doesn't matter which party you like or don't like. It's all based on, on deception uh, because they want your vote. In a democracy, they want your vote. So they're going to tell you what they want you to hear, so you'll vote for them. Right? Um, and, uh, and in dictatorship, they, they'll tell you what they want you to hear, so you know, you'll, you'll be afraid of them, I mean, because you don't vote. Uh, either way. But here's the point. In a relationship, if somebody deceived you, would you ever trust that person again completely? I'm just asking you. No. Okay. A lot of people saying no, no, not really. Okay. Well, that's Descartes' point. That if, a, I mean, he's not making this point. I'm making this point just to make it even sharper for you. That if someone ever deceived you in a relationship, it would be difficult to fully trust that person, right? Okay, afterwards you would always maybe suspect them and not fully trust them. It's a funny thing about human existence. Trust is hard to build, right? Trust can, can take a long time to build, but distrust can happen very quickly, correct? Okay, you all understand this. So it's not really very balanced. It's kind of lopsided picture. It takes a long time to build trust with somebody, but that trust can easily be eroded by one instance of deception discovered. So if that's the case, and if someone deceives you even once, you would never fully trust them again. This is exactly Descartes' point about the senses, that the senses may be reliable most of the time. He's not saying they aren't. But what he's saying is that if they're capable of deceiving us at any time, then how can we ever really know for sure whether we're being deceived or not? Okay, so th that's his point. And uh, let's just finish the reading. We'll come back and have a few minutes uh, for discussion. But I want to come back now and just finish the meditation. See, these meditations are not, um, they're not um, very long, but they're very deep, right? They, give, they, they make us think quite a bit, and which is a good thing in philosophy. We want you to think. Philosophers like to think. And we certainly encourage you all to be thinking more than you might otherwise about these subjects. So let me come back to the share. Uh, if I can locate it, uh, uh, Zoom is not is not being friendly here. Oh, there it is. I think I've got it now. Um, okay, are we back to the text? Are you seeing the text? Yes, it's back to the text. Yes. Thank you very yep. much. Okay, good to know. So he says that you know if 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 he can imagine now that God is able to do this because Descartes does believe in God, but of course God is omnipotent, one of the properties when we start thinking about traditional God. And I mean, he, we're speaking now of the God of the Abrahamic faiths. We're talking about the God of, of Jews, Christians, and Muslims. We're talking about the God of the Abrahamic faiths. That's one God, one being, and that God supposedly is what? Omnipotent means all-powerful, omniscient means all-knowing, and omnibenevolent means, you know, all you know, good. Uh, and that's what we generally are taught to believe uh, uh, are the properties, if you like, or the attributes of this kind of God. So God is omnipotent for sure in this context, and Descartes believes in that. He was brought up in French 
uh, Catholic society. He went to a Jesuit school, so he believed in, in, in that God. And he said, well, God is omnipotent, so that means God can do anything that God wants. So he says it would be possible for God to, for whatever reasons God may have, he says, I don't know, but it would be possible for God to create a universe in which I'm just dreaming, you know, that everything is real, but really nothing is real. Yeah? I mean, anything would be possible if you push it that far. And so he goes on to say that if you push the skepticism to its limit, um, that I will suppose then, and this is the sort of conclusion of the first meditation, I will suppose then, not that there was a supremely good God, remember God is traditionally omnibenevolent, supremely good, who is the source of all truth, but that there is an evil demon. He's not talking about God, but he's saying, let's say there's some evil demon who's almost as powerful or as powerful and cunning, who works as hard as he can to deceive me. He's conducting a thought experiment. Imagine some evil demon with almost the same power as God and who wants only to deceive us. And so I will say that sky, air, earth, color, shape, sound, and other external things, all the stuff that we know about from the senses, are just dreamed illusions, which the demon uses to ensnare my judgment. I will regard myself as not having hands, eyes, flesh, blood, and senses, but as having the false belief that I have all these things. I will obstinately concentrate on this meditation and will thus ensure by mental resolution that if I do not really have the ability to know the truth, I will at least withhold assent from what is false and from what a deceiver may try to put over on me, however powerful and cunning he may be. Okay, so this is just a concise or maybe not so concise, a summary of the radical kind of skepticism that Descartes wants to apply to his own experience of life. So that ultimately, if you think of it in this way, if there were some supremely powerful being out there to deceive us, there would be very little at the end of the day that we would be able to know for sure. Although in meditation two, Descartes will discover one thing, and that becomes the key to his philosophy, to his epistemology and other other aspects of his philosophy. And we'll come to that in my section M on Thursday, and I hope you will come to that um, with your breakout lectures in your other sections this week. So he leaves us with a kind of paradox. Um, you know, uh, beginning of meditation too, he gets very uh, depressed <laughs> because he says yesterday's meditation, like this is the next day, right? He's saying yesterday's <coughs> meditation has hurled me into doubts so great I can neither ignore them nor think my way out of them. And so this is, he's going to, in meditation too, find a way out of this tremendous predicament that he's put himself in and put, our, put, himself all, put us all in. Okay? So, uh, yeah, Spinoza came later, Arsh. I'm looking back at the, uh, at the chat room. Uh, Spinoza was influenced uh, somewhat by Descartes, not totally, uh, but Spinoza was thinking partly along those lines at times. So Descartes had a tremendous influence. Believe me, very, very big influence. What if our mind is that evil demon? Wow, what a great question. If our, if our own mind is that evil demon, then we're all in trouble. <laughs> and uh, actually, uh, if you think about it now, Descartes is, is really um, kind of leading us there indirectly because we are also self-deceived, is it not the case? It's not, it's not simply the case that our senses deceive us about the world, which they do at times, and that others may deceive us in order to profit from the deception, right? Or in some way benefit themselves at our expense. So it's sometimes kind of malevolent deceit. But isn't it the case, but isn't it the case that we're all self-deceived at times? I mean, how we see ourselves and how others see us? Isn't there a disconnect there at times? <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I'm glad that you're thinking about these things. I don't want you to lose sleep over any of it unless it turns out I've awakened in you, you know, a true quest to be a philosopher, in which case you may lay awake at night, but I wouldn't worry about it too much. I'm just hoping and, and seeing that you are being willing to expand your minds and to think about these questions seriously and wonder about things that you may not have wondered about since you were a small child. Part of what happens in our education system is 
that even though we need to be uh, spending more and more time in school learning things to be functional and contributive members of society, it's, it's ever more complex and we need ever more amounts of education, you know, to really attain our potential. That, that's probably true in most cases. But also education tends to crush at times our imagination and, and tends, us, uh, you know, tends to want to make us grow up and stop being children. <clears throat> but philosophers will have this kind of childlike, not childish, I hope, but a childlike wonder at the world and, and continuously, very much like Einstein, who had this very innocent, childlike kind of approach, which allowed him to see very deeply, okay, because he was also skeptical, all right? <clears throat> so somebody said, uh, Sudenor said, <clears throat> this was my first philosophy class, and I was so intrigued about everything. Well, I'm really glad. That means we've made a good start. Um, and, and I hope to, to intrigue you and to get you thinking. Like I said, every, every philosopher is going to be different, and uh, every section is grouped so that they're going to be discussing related things within that section. We have three sections in the course, as you know, if you've looked ahead. Uh, so uh, I hope to, to continue to intrigue you. I picked out some of the most interesting philosophers, certainly from the Western tradition. And uh, I think this is only the beginning. If you're already a little bit intrigued, Wait, we're going to, I'll try and blow your minds totally. You know, that's partly my job to subvert your beliefs. So whatever you may believe, I will offer you reasons maybe to disbelieve it or believe something else. And also to hopefully keep you intrigued with what? The powers of our own minds. And when we start making inquiry in fruitful directions, we will come up with all kinds of interesting ideas. Let me leave you uh, with, one, with one thought. Uh, but first, uh, are there any questions about what we've covered today? Because mission accomplished, we've, we've got Descartes' first meditation done. Um, so I want to back to you and see if there are any, um, I feel these stupid questions make, no, th no, there are no stupid questions. Remember, remember, uh, in philosophy, only stupid answers sometimes from philosophers, but no stupid questions. All questions are important. Remember that, okay? Philosophy is pushing the limits of the human mind. That's exactly right. Ramsey's good analogy, pushing the limits of the human mind. That's how we grow. Uh, it's not just physically. If we want to be an athlete, imagine you want to be an athlete or you are an athlete. What do you do when you train? You push the limits of your body, correct? You push the limits, yes? Training means doing more than you were capable of yesterday, correct? Okay? Training your body means you're always pushing. You're always pushing the limits in order to grow stronger, and more skilled in your sport, right? To achieve performance at a higher level. You have to push the limits. That's what training is supposed to do. And philosophy is training the mind. Okay? So think about it that way. And if you push the limits of your mind and train your mind, you'll be able to do more things today than you could yesterday and tomorrow more than today. Is there any, okay, questions or, or housekeeping questions? Do we have to attend the meeting on Thursday? Kendrick, if you're in my section M, are you in my section M? Or are you in some other section? Um, those of you who are in my section M, um, you know, for uh, M for McDonald's or M for Monday, that section M, yeah, we meet on Thursday at 11 o'clock and we meet on Blackboard. Remember, we go back to the Blackboard platform for our breakout lecture Thursday. Uh, but if you're not in my section M, then you're in somebody else's section. And yes, you will have to attend whatever, uh, whatever uh, you know, class time is scheduled with them. Uh, is there any homework? Well, yes, Ramses, I'm asking you to read and think about Meditation 1. And if you want to look ahead at Meditation 2 and read it by Thursday, that would be very good because we're going to discuss it. Okay? Um, that's a complicated question, Arsh. Will, where will the recordings be posted? Okay, Aruba, maybe you came in late. Um, that's okay. Uh, the recordings will all be uploaded Monday's recordings are going to be uploaded to YouTube. There's a dedicated YouTube channel I created for Monday lectures, and your instructor should have given you the URL, and if they didn't, harass them, because I already sent it out to them, and they should have shared it with you. Please check your Blackboard announcements and check your emails. Uh, uh, that, that URL is commonly available to all of us. And today's lecture will be uploaded a little bit later today. It has to compile on my computer. It takes a little while for Zoom to compile it into an MP4. And then it takes a little while for it to be uploaded and processed by YouTube. But it's up there by uh, afternoon, evening, okay? Every Monday, the lecture's up there. And everybody can see it. And uh, 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 Thursday recordings in my group are done on Blackboard. So they're all going to be in the Blackboard course room 
if you know how to access the recordings, uh, you will find them there um, in your in your Blackboard. Uh, okay, so everything is going to be asynchronous. Uh, you can always review. If you have to miss a class, you can always watch the recording at your convenience. So you're in with Finn Bloom, Kendrick. That's fine. Um, so you won't be in my Thursday class, but Finn Bloom will will uh, he will carry on. I'm sure with meditation two, and uh, you'll be able to to explore Descartes further this week. Okay. Is that fair enough? Uh, the YouTube link is not working. Well, that means, Christopher, you got the wrong link. Okay, now listen to me carefully. Um, I made a mistake. I sent a massive amount of data to the adjuncts, uh, and I initially made a mistake and sent them my creator link, which, of course, doesn't work for you because it's a link to my YouTube creator studio where I upload. But then I corrected that mistake last week, and on Friday... I sent them all the correct link and posted the correct link on my Blackboard page. If you did not yet get the correct link uh, to YouTube because it has the creator uh, thing in the URL, please ask your instructor to send you the correct link, okay? That is really important. After class now, it's going to end. We're already over time. I'm going to end the class. I'm going to make sure that all the instructors that is all your instructors have the correct link and that they share it with you. Okay? The YouTube channel, Zuleika, is the link that you're going to be sent or that you should already have been sent. Okay? And you will get that you you'll get that link very shortly. Oh, look at this. Sheila, good for you. Uh, for anyone who's able to copy this link uh, or just click it from the chat room, Sheila has put up the correct link. Okay? So thank you so much for that. But don't worry, you'll get it in multiple emails until you all have it and save it. And um, and the link you you were sent did not work, so later because it was the wrong link. We all make mistakes, and me included. But I try and correct them as soon as possible. Okay. So the correct link was already sent out, and that's why Sheila has it. Or Sheila, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, Sheila, that is correct. What you just posted is correct. And everybody take note of that. That is the YouTube channel where today's lecture will be later uploaded. Okay? And all the Monday lectures will be uploaded. All right. Thank you very much. This has been a great, I think, introductory class. Uh, our first uh, lecture of the term. Uh, you should also know that I'm going to do this every Monday, rain or shine. Uh, just because we need to retain the scheduling. Uh, and the and the you know the, the 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 linkage between the first lecture and the breakout lecture, just in case you're in a different section, and we don't want to lose that that kind of synchronization. So you're free to take legal holidays. If a holiday falls on a Monday, take it. But I'll be here lecturing. If anybody wants to attend live, you're more than welcome. And if you miss a Monday lecture because of a holiday, uh, you can always go to YouTube later and view it. Okay, that way everybody's in the loop and uh, it's asynchronous. I wish you a very good week. Those of you in Section M, I will see you Thursday at 11 o'clock on Blackboard. And to the rest of you, have a productive week. Have a good breakout lecture. And uh, please read Descartes Meditation 2. Okay, that's all for now. Nice to work with you today. Nice to meet you. And I'll look forward to the remainder of the term with you. Bye for now. Thank, Thank you, Professor. Bye -bye. Have a good day. You're more than welcome. Well, a parrot? Is that a budgie or a parrot? It's a budgie, not a parrot, right? It's a Quaker parrot, actually. Wow, it looks like a parrot. Does it speak? Uh, not yet. He... Teach it some philosophy terms, okay? Have a have a philosophical conversation. To be honest, she's kind of stupid. She can't say any words. Well, babies don't speak when they're first born either, but they can learn. I'm sure birds are pretty smart at mimicking language, some of them. All right, folks, have a wonderful week. I'll see you, some of you on Thursday, some of you next Monday.